Good morning, Village Green, and everyone who's here in person and those who are at home. We're so happy that you're here with us on this Advent Sunday of joy. Um, so would you stand and sing at, with joy as we worship our God this morning? in just a moment, and we will give you a bit of an introduction before that, so just bear with us. Good morning. There we go. Sorry about that. So uh, we have a special uh, presentation for you this morning that our Infinity Youth have been working on very hard for the past couple months. And so uh, we just want to give you a little bit of an introduction as to what that is. Hi, I'm Jade. You all know me. Um, I might be wearing a wig, though. Um, the youth drama, we, uh, we practice every week. Uh, they always come in an hour before youth starts. Um, and 
it like drama is a big thing for me, and they really like it, and we've been working on it. So I hope you like it. And this is called the greatest gift giver. So we hope you enjoy. Often when a gift is given, it says more about the giver than it does about the receiver. And for the many different gifts we receive, there is just as many different givers. What kind of gift giver are you? There's the bad rapper. Merry Christmas! I ran out of newspaper, so I just stuffed it in a grocery bag. Uh, thanks. There's the re-gifter. I got you something. <laughs> There's the sentimental gifter. Go ahead, open it. It's an old shoe. Remember when we were seven and you lost a shoe at the park? I found it. Yeah, wow. <laughs> There's the... Happy birthday! My birthday was two months ago. Belated gifter. Don't forget the price tag lever honor. It was hard to find and very expensive. I had to special order it from Germany. This says clearance three ninety nine. Dang now it. <laughs> the vague gifter. Hey grandma. <laughs> oh, thanks, Grandma. A Hello Kitty pencil. Well, I'm a girl, so. <laughs> the overgifter. I got you a Lexus with a big red bow on it. What? Um, I got you some sandwich bread. <laughs> That's cool. And there's the undergifter. The insecure gifter. It's a hat. You probably have a million of them. You can take it back and get what you like. I love it. Sorry, I know it's terrible. There are seats in the box. I said I love it. It's much better than the lazy gifter. I got you a gift card. I didn't even go to the restaurant. I got it at Walmart. It was literally all I could do to grab a handful of these suckers for my friends. I hope you can get dinner at Olive Garden for 10 bucks or less. Or the hijacker. It's for me too, we went together. <laughs> Some gifters are researchers. I called up your office and talked to your boss who faxed me some wadded up papers he found in your trash. Then I had to call the Library of Congress. <laughs> Others are more like the obligatory gifters. I drew your name, so. That's the thing I got you. Take it or leave it. It makes no difference to me. <laughs> and there's the mafioso, strings attached manipulator. I'm going to give you a gift you can't refuse. I do for you. Maybe in the future when I need you, you do for me. Capiche? <laughs> So many gifts, so many givers. But on this day, when we celebrate the greatest gift. What kind of gifter is God? He's the I've known you and watched you bloom kind of gifter. I made you and formed you in the womb kind of gifter. He's the I know what you want and need kind of gifter. And all that is found in me kind of gifter. So, so celebrate. Celebrate children of God. Rejoice. In Emmanuel, God is with us. He's restored the broken and brought us to him. He's taken us out of our slavery to sin. He's the wonderful, wonderful counselor to keep us from danger. A mighty God laid soft in the manger. Everlasting Father who won't fade away. The, the Prince, Prince of Peace. We celebrate today. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. To God be our praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. No condemnation this day. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Our God we adorn. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ Jesus is born. Wait. I have one last gift. All oh, right. right. There's, There's a, a dramatic, dramatic gifter. <laughs> awesome. Get one more round of applause. They did such a good job, didn't they? And now, uh, as a youth group, we're going to be lighting the Advent candles. So I'm going to hand it on over to them. This morning, we light the candle of hope, the candle of peace, and the candle of joy. We need to remind ourselves that Christmas comes from divine initiative, the unshakable hands of a loving God with unlimited resources and the unbridled enthusiasm. Jill Briscoe. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Joy is discovered in a person named Jesus. All of our fears, terrors, worries, and what-ifs can be replaced in front of him. An unknown future can be viewed through the reality of the incarnation Jesus, Emmanuel, God, with us. And because of this good news, we can be confident in our hope, our peace, and our joy, and be assured that God's kingdom is never in crisis. Perhaps the greatest miracle is not so much a baby born of a virgin, but the awesome identity of the baby, Emmanuel, God with us. Yep. And, Ju and Julianne, can you, can you come up here, please? Come on up here. All right. By the way, wasn't that a great skit? How many of you watching it said, oh, that's me? All right. And there was about three or four of them <laughs> right, that were me. But Julianne, that was really wonderful. And we want to just give you this as a token of our appreciation for all the work that you've done. You know, I know you're going to say it wasn't a one person deal, but so many people to be thankful for. But we just appreciate everything you do with the youth, everything you do for worship. And we just want to bless you with this small token of our appreciation Thanks. this morning. Thank you. God bless you. All right, thanks. There's even an X here, so I know where this goes. <laughs> All right. So this message is brought to you by one who raps poorly, last moment, and uses still her parents' wrapping paper. <laughs> and I, I actually, my mother wrapped everything with me this year. So, at least what's been purchased so far. <laughs> to the youth, thank you so, so much. That was beautiful, beautiful event. It was really, uh, you are m most talented and the, the message that you brought is 
very, very sweet. And Julianne, thank you again so very, very much for your leadership and all the people that participate in, in helping. So next week is kind of a big Sunday. It seems that it would be Christmas Eve. And in all the excitement, we want you to remember that the service isn't at 10 a.m., but it is at 6.30 p.m. And that is the special Christmas Eve service. After that, Sunday falls on New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, there is not a service within this particular facility on that day, but it is instead a time where we honor all of the volunteers who will be celebrating the Sabbath and worshiping with their families. And just as a, a thought of all that that means when we say volunteers that are making this possible for us to worship here, uh, we think of those who open the building and set it up, the ushers and greeters who greet us, those who are counters, those who are praying in the prayer room before, those who teach me how to use devices like this, those who are working at the back so that there is lighting and there is sound and there is a live stream for those to enjoy. There are people who make our coffee and greet us at the welcome desk. And there are people on another floor of this building with children's kids connection, youth in their leadership. There is so much more. So all of those people, uh, we thank you. And uh, we really appreciate all that you do each Sunday, each of the volunteers there. And there are more, and I'm sorry if I forgot to list them all. Now, when we come to January, we come to a time on the 17th where we start a new 10-week message series on the book of Revelation. This is fabulous. We are so excited and looking forward to the message that our pastor will bring to us and what we will be studying as we read through that book. And it's the start of life groups. So this is a time to think about your life group or joining a life group. There are sign-up sheets and a person to help you at the welcome desk here. It's a great time to join something new. And if your schedule changes in the life group that you're in, you need to rework the timing of that. We can help you with that. Life groups are small collections of people that meet in a home in this building, online, it can be hybrid. There is every opportunity to find a place for you in a life group in the life group that I am with, and it's very much all like all the others. It's a group where we grow together, we pray together, we read scripture together, and we have snacks, and we have snacks, <laughs> and we sing, and we have more snacks, and we bring snacks, and we consume snacks, but we, we read the Bible, and we pray while eating our snacks. So your life group may have another theme. And I really encourage you to, to join a, a life group. And uh, a connection card can do that online. There is a connection card and it has the opportunity for you to check off. It doesn't say snacks, it says life group. Okay. Now, this is also coming up to a time of year where in our families we contemplate the stewardship of all of the gifts that we have and we think about as we are making gifts at the end of the year and from Village Green we would ask you to consider the church amongst these gifts and in a bit I'm going to pray with you about this but before that I wanted to add one tiny little uh, announcement that's not really written there. It's really a thank you. As I look out at all of you over the year, I'm going to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and just let you know that you are so wonderful in your smiles and in your attentiveness and helping us with all of these messages. That's just a, a Kathleen thank you to you. So welcome to this worship service. Thank you again for the presentation and a welcome and a wave to those online so that I don't forget all of you. And as the ushers come forward, I'll just speak a little prayer uh, about these gifts. And it'll be a thanks to God and that it brings honor and glory to his name. So if you'll join me. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you and to worship you. You are great, and you are with us, and you love us. And we thank you for the gifts that you have given us and for these gifts that we return for the work that we see here. We see the baptisms, we see the parental dedications, the memberships, the growth, the increasing number of people who have joined and the, the work that is being done in your name here locally within this community in London and also with missionaries across the world. We thank you. We thank you for all that you do in making this possible in what you have given us and we pray that all of this brings glory and honor to your name. We thank you for coming and being with us, Emmanuel. Amen. And as the offering is being taken up, would you uh, sing with us? You can stand or sit as is comfortable for you. Um, we'll have another time of worship on this joyful Sunday morning. <laughs> Oh, come on, ye
Let us pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that we have been able to gather in this way, both online and in person. We pray, Lord, that during this season, we would just know the hope, the peace, the love, and the joy of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we commit this time to you. We thank you for your presence among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Wonderful to have you here this morning. Good to see you. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, youth go as well. Kids are now being dismissed, so they can go as well. Okay. I want, to, uh, I, I want to just reiterate something that is happening in January, and I know Kathleen brought it up in the, um, in the strategic communication, but we're doing a study beginning January the 14th on the book of Revelation. Um, Ten-week study. Now, um, that's the second week of January, but I want to encourage you to be here. If you're interested in the study of the book of Revelation, you know, be here for January 7th. That's the first Sunday back after Christmas Eve, okay? Because I'm going to do a special introductory message to the 10 weeks, okay? Um, it's going to sort of set the tone, set the expectations, tell you where we're coming from with the book of Revelation. Um, I rarely do this in an introductory, in a series of this kind, but this is, this is such an important book, and there's lots of times I get up on the platform, I'm ready to say something, or I'm ready to start a series, or ready to start a message, and I'm going, what was I thinking? <laughs> Ever had that feeling? Okay. Well, that was my initial thought when I put down on the calendar, we're going to do the book of Revelation. Well, what am I thinking? Okay. But I cannot tell you in literally the months of study that I've done just how important this book is today. I cannot stress how important this book is for today. So I know that's really ominous, but the reality is you are going to be incredibly blessed by this particular study. I know I already have been. And um, anyway, but January 7th, first Sunday back, we're going to open up the you know, kind of background and how we're going to go through the book of Revelation, okay? Um, I have another tension this morning. We're going through Advent. And as many of you know, as we get into this particular message this morning, you know, we've already talked about hope. We've already talked about peace. And next week at the Christmas Eve service, we're going to focus on love and light the Christ candle and just celebrate the season. But the third week of Advent is always a struggle for me, Okay? Because it's all about joy. Now, I don't know about you, but Christmas isn't always a joyful time for many people. This is the time of year where any loss that you've experienced, anything that has been hurtful in the year, the people that are no longer with us, they, it just gets amplified at Christmas time. I think one of the most powerful things I heard a number of years ago was that Christmas is an amplifier. And I can't remember who I had heard it from or how many you know, people I'd heard reiterate it. But isn't it true that Christmas can be an amplifier? If the year's been a really good year, it can amplify all the good things that's happened and you, know, you kind of celebrate that. But if it's been a bad year, it has a way of reminding us and amplifying the things that we have been hurt by or the losses that we're experiencing and all of those kinds of things. And joy is one of those hard topics to talk about in a season where many people are not necessarily experiencing joyfulness. Now, in a cultural sense, um, the culture that we live in is on a happiness journey. Right? I, I did away a long time ago with people wanting to be on a spiritual journey or a quest to find themselves or anything like that. All of that's been kind of eliminated in our world. Everyone's on a happiness quest. 
How many times have you heard somebody say, I just want them to be miserable? <laughs> you all knew where I was going with that. I all want people to be happy. But happiness is kind of this empty thing. So I thought I would start this message out with giving you the six things. This is in a Time magazine article that was given in January 2023. Is one of their first articles at the start of this year. And it was the six things that you think will make you happy, but actually have the opposite effect. You ready? Here are the six things. Dodging your negative emotions. Okay? This has linked that if you bottle up your emotions, like frustrations, disgust, it actually makes people more aggressive actually makes people more aggressive. So if you're kind of holding everything in, it's going to naturally lead you to being unhappy. Okay? Here's the second one. The second one actually surprised me, really surprised me. I wasn't expecting it at all. Living in the city. Believe it. Living in the city. There's all these statistics about how much anxiety uh, is increased and stress and plain old unhappiness because you live in a city. In fact, some studies have said the taller the buildings, the more insignificant you feel around them. Okay? That was a real surprise. Now, for us country folk, we totally get that. (laughs) Right? Right? I was in the city 27 years, moved to the country, I go, oh. You know, you ever get the aha moment? We got that aha moment. Okay? Never going back. Never going. Living in the city. Okay, here's the third one that kind of surprised me too, having tons of free time. It's good to have free time, but there's there's a time where it's just so much free time that you actually become unproductive and feel that you have no worth in your life, and you become unhappy. So tons of free time can do that to you, okay? Um, Getting into the whole retirement thing, but isn't that amazing? that people who are retired are still doing stuff in order to stay busy and feel productive, okay? This next one we all know, chasing success. Chasing success. Everybody knows that success is only a temporary high, that, you know, you can achieve it, but it's not going to be what gives you ultimate happiness over the long period of time. Here's, the other, here's another one that surprised me, anonymity. We don't want to be known by people. But this has a lot to do with community. They did a little experiment, okay? They, they said to people, would you be happier if you lost your wallet and it was part of community where you knew they were going to return your wallet with everything in it? That's the kind of community we want to be a part of. So... When we know that we're part of a community that's going to care about us, that we're okay being known. But if we're in a community where we know that if we lose our wallet, we're done, nobody will ever return it, we'll never see it again, that makes us very unhappy in the world that we live in. In fact, if we know that we're part of a community that's going to give back our wallet, we ourselves have the tendency that if we're the ones to find the wallet, we're going to have the tendency to give it back as well. Okay, so that's a really, really big one. Here's another one that most of you, obviously, um, it's not a surprise, but buying fancy things. Buying fancy things. In fact, when you spend money on others and treat others well, that gives us a sense of satisfaction and happiness. And what's really interesting, the study showed that even if you gave $5, that that made a difference to your well-being and your mental health. Amazing. You know, it's not a lot. A lot of times when we feel like we have to give to others, we feel it's got to be the big things. But, you know, is it fair to say I'm at the age where I realize the most joyful things in my life are the little things, the really tiny things that maybe, maybe 
you know, a few years back, I would have thought were insignificant, but now they just fill me with so much satisfaction and personal joy that I think it's really cool. And by the way, one of the statistics I left out and I was going to get into it and I thought, no, I better not, is just the level of unhappiness for Canadians. It's startling that Canadians have been steadily declining in the rate of happiness for a number of years, in the last five or so years. Just, it's startling just how much. Albertans are the unhappiest, okay? And Ontario is second in level of unhappiness, okay? And I'm only gonna say it once, don't repeat it, but it's all gotta do with politics, okay? Shocking, absolutely shocking, okay? So happiness is a pointless goal, all right? And happiness is the shallow boat in a sea of turmoil because it descends really quickly. But the Bible does something really different when it comes to happiness. It deals mostly with this terminology of joy, that joy is this inseparable component, especially of the Christmas story. You know, we're going to read about the shepherds in a minute, but even the wise men were people who responded with joy when they realized what the star, you know, was pointing towards. So every story related to Jesus has this component of joy attached to it. So let me read really quickly the shepherds um, in Luke 2, 8 and, and 2, 11. Most of us have heard this time and time again, but I want to read it again. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And it should be up on the board soon. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. Very important to recognize that this is not a normal experience for shepherds. Okay? But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Now, in the original Greek, there's really something really significant that happens. In the original Greek, the word for gift, the word for joy, and the word for grace all come from the same root word, okay? So anytime you get these kinds of uh, words in the New Testament, they're all moving in this particular direction. So what the angels proclaim is when the news of the Savior being born reaches people, the natural response is going to be joy. The natural unless you're on the wrong side, right? Unless you're Herod or, you know, unless you're threatened by this child coming into your life. But for the most part, the angels are, you know, talking about the joy that is going to be expressed when people get this. Now, if you remember from last week, we talked about 400 years God had been silent. Silent in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Suddenly, God, after 400 years, has been now communicating and and bringing this wonderful promise of the Savior. Now, let me ask you, how much anticipation and expectation do you think there would have been in the nation of Israel after 400 years? How many of you have had a 10-year-old and watched them anxious two months before Christmas? Is there a lot of anticipation and expectation at that time? Can you imagine if you made them wait 400 years? Okay? There'd be a lot of pent-up expectation and anticipation, wouldn't there be? Okay? So you have to recognize that what the angels proclaim is something that the nation has been waiting for for 400 years. And because it's fully coming to realization, 
the expression that can only be you know, communicated is one of joy that is finally, finally here, okay? Which is what I, what I think I've learned about joy in, in, in reading this, okay? So the angels can confidently say that when people hear this, that's what's going to be expressed, is this thing of joy. And this is what I realized about joy, okay? I don't know if this is going to be true about you, but joy is the natural response when meaning and hope collide. Joy is the natural response when meaning and hope collide. That'll soon be up on the board so you can read it again. Isn't that true? That here is what the angels are communicating, that now there is meaning because the Savior of the world has come. No longer, no longer do you have to rely on on the law system or the system of sacrifice for the nation of Israel. Now a Savior has been born. Meaning is now entered into life. The hope, too, of waiting for 400 years and the anticipation and expectation is now finally here. So when meaning and hope collide, joy is the natural expression of those two when that happens. You guys tracking with me? Let me explain it further, okay? I realized this just a few weeks ago when we were in England. Many of you know that our son in England, his family, they, they had a granddaughter. So we have a new granddaughter, okay? And we went when she was only one week old, okay? Now, what would get my carcass into a metal tube, <laughs> sardined, for seven and a half hours across the Atlantic, breathing recycled air, a torture I had to pay for, by the way, (laughs) to get to a baby that's, we celebrated her one week when we got there, okay, that could only do four things, Eat, cry, sleep, and poop. (laughs) Maybe a fifth. (laughs) That was it. That was it. And yet, and yet, it was filled with joy. And yet it was filled with joy. Because on a personal level, it had all this meaning. It had all this hope. And the natural response to those was joy. Our oldest son uh, battled leukemia, was told that he would never be able to have children. And here's the second, and we praise God. And it's a joyful... (laughs) See, when you experience meaning and hope in your life, the natural response is joy. And that's what we experience. You know, come home and I want to go back, yeah. right? Yeah. But you know, you know what I'm talking about. Joy is the natural response when meaning and hope collide. And that's the announcement of the angels. Guess what? Life has now got this brand new meaning. The Savior of the world has come. We can now have peace between ourselves and God. The the nation of Israel can enjoy a salvation that has been promised to them and the people of the world, even since the Abrahamic covenant was in place and the hope that you've been waiting for and anticipating in 400 years, wondering if God was even listening. It's here. It's here. And that, you know what, in in the difficulties of December and the difficulties that we experience at Christmas time and all the things that we become saddened about and, 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 and and the way that we can be saddened by the losses that we have in our lives, there is the ability to still feel joy because of the meaning and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Okay? 
And that's the beautiful thing. When we have this joy and, it, and it's expressed, it deepens our faith, doesn't it? When, when, when God acts in this way, it deepens our faith. It uh, prompts gratitude. Do you know that the most joyful people are people who have a natural ability to be thankful for everything in their life? And do you know that gratitude um, actually prompts more joy in life? We, we just think the joyful people are the people who have gratitude. It's absolutely the opposite. The more gratitude you have, the more thankfulness you have, and see the world through the positive light that it can have, you have natural joy in your life, okay? And not only that, but you know what I love about joy? It's contagious. It's contagious. How many, how many grumpy gusses have a following? Oh, you, know, you, know, you know what I mean, right? You know, get up in the don't talk to me in the morning. I'm in my, you know, you know even, even their coffee cup warns you. Maybe you're, every, every of those people, right? You know, don't talk before coffee, nothing, you know, you know, that kind of thing, okay? It becomes contagious. And you know what? Jesus Christ is the source of all joy. Jesus Christ is the source of all joy. When we, when we acknowledge that, when we embrace that, when we recognize that even in the midst of the difficulties of life and all that it can bring, the meaning and the hope that Jesus brings into our lives allows us to see the difficulties in a brand new light through the lens of eternity and through the lens that this is only temporary. All of this will pass and a glorious sunrise will come. I love what C.S. Lewis is, you know, Many of you know C.S. Lewis wrote, you know, Surprised by Joy. And he's got all these quotes. This ended up being my favorite quote. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Joy is the serious business of heaven. It's not about happiness. It's not about those fleeting moments. And we try to hang on to them you know, desperately because we're lacking something in our lives. But joy is this deep understanding that there's much more that I can be thankful for and blessed by because of my faith in Jesus Christ, because he brings meaning into my life, brings hope into my life. And because of those two, I can live a life full of joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, joy is such a difficult idea for many this time of year. There's a lot of hurt and pain. There's a lot of expectations, a lot of anticipation. A lot of things that can make life feel that like it's more difficult than it's worth. But Lord, when we take away all those things that distract us and we look at Jesus. What a difference that makes. The shepherds recognized it right away. Probably um, in that culture, a people who weren't even respected or didn't have the kind of social status that many other groups did. And yet their response to what they had just witnessed was one of utter joy. And the, and the angels recognized that too because they knew that in the birth of this child, meaning was now a part of the message and certainly hope was as well. So they could easily proclaim that joy would be the byproduct of that. So Lord, in the midst of this season, I want to pray for those who are having a difficult time, a time where they're being reminded of their own personal losses, where they're being reminded of the difficulties that they're experiencing, 
that they're being reminded that someone that they love and care for deeply is hurting. Lord, I pray that they would see the potential for joy in the person of Jesus. So Lord, as we gather next week on Christmas Eve at 6.30, we pray that we would come with open hearts to see Christ for who he is so that our Christmas can be different from everyone else's and that our lives can shine with the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love found only in Jesus Christ. And in his name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Would you join us as we sing a song uh, where we can go and tell of this beautiful joy we can have in Jesus. So stand and sing with us as you're able. and the joy of Jesus at this time of year. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week for Christmas Eve. Bye.